Hello everybody, my name is Diana Cotter. I am a horticulturalist, I'm a garden designer, I'm a garden consultant, and my real passion is attracting wildlife to the garden. So if you have any questions following this presentation, if you'd like to post them, then I can answer them then. Let's get started. These are just a few quotes from Adrian Hoskins, who wrote a wonderful book called Butterflies of the World. Stems, foliage, other food. Unfortunate compulsion with neatness. A great tragedy awaits the insect world. And tidy gardens with little food. So these just sort of summed up why I think it's quite important. Uh, it just got me thinking about the whole um, idea of attracting uh, wildlife. So why do we want to attract wildlife? There is a severe lack of natural habitat. Hab habitat. We've got more housing, we've got forestry going on a pace, chopping down old growth forest, we've got new roads, um, less and less for the wildlife that we're hoping to attract. It's very satisfying to know that we're doing a little bit to help this. We don't seem to be getting much help from government at the moment from either side. So what we can do ourselves is very satisfying. It's very good for your health, and I think in particular for your mental health, to know that we're part of a, uh, a larger being. It definitely engages all the senses, and best of all, we are engaging with nature. So what do you want to attract? Birds, butterflies, under that little white arrow on that top photo to the right is a lizard. We've got a cute little possum. We've got small birds, and we've got this creature at the end that looks like a fly is actually a native bee, a stingless bee, with two large bags of pollen that he's collected. Do we, however, want caterpillars, spiders, aphids, and brush-tailed possums? Not so cute as so on. We have to have them. It's all part and parcel. Without these guys, we won't have the animals from the previous slide. George Carlin, a famous comedian. Butter caterpillars do all the work. Butterflies get the publicity. We just notice all the holes in our leaves and go, oh my God, I have to kill that caterpillar. But no, wait, 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 we need to keep it. What else don't you want? Big possums, flies, mosquitoes, wasps, snails and slugs, caterpillars, spiders, cats and dogs, which can be quite destructive, in fact, very destructive to our wildlife. This picture here is of a European wasp, quite different to a bee, and he is a pest of the greatest degree. So of the whole list, that is the one that I would not include, but all the rest are very useful. So how to attract birds or wild, wildlife? I'm going to concentrate on birds. There is so much that I could be telling you about butterflies and various other creatures, but we don't have enough time. So we're going to concentrate on birds. These ones here, the first picture is of a red wattle bird. Then in the middle is a big pest. He is an Indian miner who is quite different to that lower left-hand picture. He is our native noisy miner and he is welcome. The guy in the middle is not. And the rainbow lorikeet, that picture on the right-hand side, um, beautiful bird, but his numbers or their numbers are getting way out of proportion compared to other birds. So what I really want to try to attract and focus on today is the smaller birds. The first picture is of hornbills. Then we've got a New Holland honey eater. Down below him is a little blue wren. And then in the middle there, we've got a little pardalot. If you don't see these birds very often in your garden, it's because you've possibly not got the right habitat for them. So what do we need? What do they need? They need food. They need water and shelter, a nesting spot, nesting materials, peace and quiet, no feral predators. And we need a maintenance plan to make sure that they stay in our gardens. The maintenance plan, you may be pleased to know, is basically doing as little as possible. The spiders, very useful if looking at nesting materials. Their web is what a lot of these small birds use to bind their nests together. 
and also they're a food source. So we need trees and shrubs and grasses and ground covers. Which of these is the most important? It's a bit like looking at our food pyramid. Bit of a trick question. Which is most important? Start from the ground up. If we haven't got leaf matter, uh, leaf buildup, mulch, compost, various other things on our beds, we won't have any microbes and bacteria and fungi. They are the ones that convert food, uh, leaves, and anything else we're going to add. They're the ones that convert it to nutrients that the plants are going to take up. So if you haven't got a good mulch regime going and changing that mulch all the time, then we're not going to have those very, very basic creatures which will support those options above. This was a wonderful poster I found from Birds Australia. I was amazed at how many different sorts of birds and their needs we can find in the garden. This uh, presentation is going to be on the library, on Moreland Library YouTube. So you can go through this at your leisure. I'm just going to whiz through it quickly because we don't have tons of time. We've got hawkers that catch insects in the air. We've got shrub eaters or seed eaters. We've got nectar feeders. We've got insect feeders. We've got meat eaters, pouncers, ground foragers, salliers. They fly into the air to catch the prey. Introduced species, they're mainly found around man-made structures. And we've got birds of prey. So we've got to try to accommodate for as many of these as possible. So the plants for small birds. The best ones really are local natives or indigenous plants. This photo is of a Grevillea rosminifolia. It's called rosminifolia because the foliage is very much like rosemary. It has small flowers, which means that the small birds can get their little bills into it. And some of those bigger birds who are bully birds, they will fly around in packs and attack lone birds. Uh, they can't get their bills as easily into these flowers. So small flowers are very useful. The fact that it's prickly means that the birds can't get in there to take the, the, the predatory birds can't get in there to take the eggs and the baby birds. And also they will flower inside the shrub. So they, some of these little birds don't actually have to leave their cover to go out. We want to plant these shrubs in thickets, which means that we want to have two or three of them planted together. So there's plenty of food to support the birds that we're trying to attract. They produce small twigs for nesting materials. And if there aren't enough um, twigs and material for the birds to build their nests, you can always uh, try to provide hollows in trees or nesting boxes. We've got our nectivores. These eat nectar. The nectar provides moisture for them. We want to plan to have plants for food all year round. So I don't have any problems putting in um, ornamental plants which haven't evolved in Australia. I'm a great fan of salvias and agastache and various other plants which will flower in the summer when a lot of the natives aren't flowering. Ne most natives try to tend to flower in winter and spring. So these other guys will provide food when those aren't in flower. The picture on the right hand side is actually uh, an acacia and that is also very prickly. So that's providing a wonderful habitat for the birds as well. There's a list of plants here, um, but um, a lot of the publications that um, Moreland and all council have on their indigenous plants can be found on their websites or you can actually order the little booklets. So I won't spend too much time going through these plants in, in great detail. We've got our granivores. These are things like finches and mannequins. Um, you won't find them in your garden unless you've got indigenous grasses. So uh, we've got things like poa and themida and lamandra and ostrodanthonia. Um, they will provide lots of seed. I chop mine right back to the ground in the winter to allow rain to get in, but I leave all the grasses surrounding the plants to add to the mulch layer and the birds might find the seeds a bit more easily as well. So these native grasses need to be planted next to taller shrubs and trees so the birds feel safe jumping down to start eating the seed. 
Then we've got our insectivores, things like fairy wrens and yellow robins and wagtails, thornbills and honey eaters. They will find a lot of the insects in the leaf litter. So don't bag up all your leaves and chuck them in the green bin. Keep them on the ground if possible. There's a nice big fat juicy caterpillar waiting to be eaten, which has fallen from the tree above. And those little mushrooms or toadstools will also get eaten by various creatures. So the insects will also be found in the bark of trees, in the stems and the trunks of trees and of shrubs. They will also be found in the flowers that attract the insects. So things like banks will attract an enormous amount of insects. So the birds will find those insects um, on those flowers. Water is very important. That first picture we can see some little thornbills, actually they're silver eyes, um, having a bath. They need water to keep their plumes healthy, their, all their feathers. The next picture in the middle there has got round smooth rocks put in the bird bath. This is so that the birds can hop out. It also is very useful if you've got things like bees, which will come and have a drink as well. They can rest on those rocks and if they do happen to land on the water, they can easily crawl out. So birds can drown and a lot of our insects can drown. The next picture shows one of our uh, native pigeons. Um, he's got branches above the bird bath. Very good if you can put your bird bath under a under a shrub or a tree with branches. What a lot of birds tend to do is they land on the branches, have a good look around to see if there's no predators, and then they'll go and have a drink and a bath if the scene is clear. At the bottom is what they don't want to see, uh, Mr. Pussycat, um, just, just making his presence known. If you have got cats and dogs, then you can also always make a, um, uh, a bird bath, which is out of reach. So here we've just got a dish with water in, which has been hung from a pergola. Very good idea. I would also definitely put some rocks in there because that looks pretty deep. And very, very important that you clean out your bird baths. Ideally, you should do it every day. I don't have time, unfortunately, so I do mine every week, but it's very, very important because diseases can spread extremely easily from bird to bird. So maintenance. Maintenance is very important to keep your birds there. As I said before, the least you do, the better. The first picture here, we've got some uh, branches which have been chopped off and they're being shoved in the van to be taken away. They will be turned into mulch, but much better if you can leave it intact in your garden, even if it's at the back where you can't see it. That makes really good habitat. So think of your garden as a forest. Nothing ever removes weeds or anything else from a forest. It all gets recycled. Return everything. Leave some areas unmulched. We've got various beetles that will lay their eggs in the soil. That egg will turn into a larva, and then the larva will hatch and, and, um, and, and pupate and turn into a beetle. And so the process goes on. But if your area is too mulched, then that beetle won't be able to lay the egg in the first place. And when the little beetle wants to emerge, if he has to fight his way through a thick layer of mulch, it's not going to happen. With your weeds, you pluck and chuck. So you pluck out your weeds and you chuck them back on top of the mulch. Um, the weeds have taken a lot of energy to form and uh, in nature, they would break down and their green leaves would be turned into nutrients to support new plants. If they're really nasty weeds like oxalis, I would be putting them into the, not the green bin, I would be putting them into the trash because you don't want to spread those oxalis to anyone else. And the same with onion weed. I'd be taking off the leaves, returning them and getting rid of the bulbs in your trash. Pruning, chop and drop. So when you prune something, let all the leaves and little branches land on the soil. They will make up the mulch layer and then you'll get lots of insects living in that. Plus the fact that they'll break down um, and um, add nutrients to the soil. Okay, um, so prune successively. You don't want to prune all your shrubs at the same time. If you've got, for example, four or five salvias, if you chop them all down, then there's going to be nothing left for the bees if you haven't got something else coming on. So you might prune one one week, one the next week, uh, and so on, so that the garden isn't bereft um, of nectar. You can also find 
some plants that will flower all year round. Some of the small grevilleas will flower all year round. Scobola will flower all year round. So try to find some plants that are giving something for those birds. Try not to interfere too much. I know we think we know best, but actually we don't. And then remember the garden is for sharing. So it's not all about what we want. We've got to have a little bit of untidiness. That green bin to the right of the picture comes from Cottesloe in Western Australia. They've painted on all the things that they think should be going into your green waste. But in fact, every single thing on that bin can help attract and keep wildlife in your garden. So do we need a green bin? Probably not. So think before you chuck anything out, that pile of old pots in the corner, very useful for lizards and beetles and all sorts of creatures that birds will eat. The two boys in the middle are not vandalizing that tree trunk, they're actually drilling holes. So they make really good places for solitary bees to lay their eggs. And you'll also find various beetles will also climb into those holes as well. So don't automatically get rid of your old tree stumps. They can be extremely useful. The little bird is having a nice forage in the leaves that have fallen. Below him, you've got a pile of logs, which will also attract beetles, uh, which many birds will eat. They'll also attract various fungi and, and other creatures, which are all very, very necessary to break down to produce food for new plants. Here we've got our lizard again in a lovely rocky outcrop uh, that will protect him from birds, cats and anything else. And it's a lovely place to sun. The, bird, the, the lizards get their energy from, from sunning themselves. And then that last pile of stuff that you would probably be chucking in a trailer and taking to the tip or putting in your green bin. Very, very useful, especially when you heap it up like that. It's a lovely habitat for birds and beetles, all sorts of creatures. With those shrubs, I would actually have left the roots in the ground um, and chopped off all the top growth. The roots will rot down and make really good um, food once again for worms and all the little creatures that live in the soil. So how to start? I find it very useful to draw up a plan. I really like the black and white plan. Uh, there's not huge areas of grass. So if I was a bird flying over that, I would think, hmm, lots of shrubs, lots of the same shrubs. Um, I'm not going to feel threatened by cats and dogs because I can fly very quickly from one plant to another. The, fo the, 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 the plan below, once again, I would be stopping there, possibly for a long time. The picture in the middle, I would keep flying, not much there to attract me at all. And the same with the picture plan on the right, there's really not enough there to attract me and make me want to stay. I'd go there if I was desperate, but I would look much prefer the first two pictures. You need to ask yourself, what will I keep and what won't I keep? Even if you've get, got a dead plant, can that provide something for birds or does it need to go? And if you are going to remove your shrubs, try to do it slowly so that you don't make your whole garden denuded and empty all at the same time, especially for the creatures that are living there already. So getting started, we want to start from the ground up, mulch, compost, leaves, uh, prunings, anything else we can find. We want to get our soil as healthy as possible, and that happens when we encourage and support fungi and bacteria that we can't even see. Once we've got our soil nice and healthy, we can do the hard landscaping, which is things like paving and decks and pergolas. Then we'll do our planting. And then we remember to do the maintenance if we need to. And if all else fails, cheat. Thank you. That's the end of the presentation, but you can find this on YouTube. We have a few questions. First of all, what do I think about feeding birds? What a fantastic question. Um, I think it's probably not a good idea. We had a food triangle in one of the earlier slides. Nature's worked it all out. They should have enough food. They get used to being fed. So if you go on holiday or for any reason you can't feed them, then they get out of the habit of finding their own food and particularly for young birds. Um, 
bread is probably the worst thing you can give to birds. It's totally unnatural. It swells up in their stomach. So then the bird's brain gets a message that it's full. So it's not looking for any more food. So all the things like the, 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 the little bugs and creatures that they're eating that they need to eat, um, they won't be feeding. It's almost like making them anorexic um, in, in, in that they're not eating the right sort of food. So I would probably not favor that. Um, are we going to attract snakes? Probably not. Snakes like a very, very quiet environment. They won't want to go into a garden unless they're absolutely desperate. They'd much rather be in a paddock or a big area. Uh, they do like grasses, um, but most snakes would rather slither away than try to attract, attack, attack you. They are fearsome when they're threatened, but as I say, usually they would much rather disappear. Um, so I think you'd be quite fine. And what about nesting boxes? Um, nesting boxes, definitely. It takes 100 years for something like a gum tree to make the right sort of hollows for a lot of our birds, and they're being chopped down left, right, and center to make room for houses and shopping centers and everything else. So I think nesting boxes are fantastic. It's worth reading about them because you want to make sure that you're attracting the right sort of birds. And um, possums are pretty good at making nests for themselves. It's much harder for a lot of the birds. So you probably want the hole to be quite small um, so that the possums don't go in. And how high would I place them? Um, so once again, it's worth doing research. Some birds won't fly higher than shrubs, so you want them to be quite low. Other birds will like them as high as possible. So work out what you're trying to attract, and then that will give you the answer of how high you should put them. Um, you may need to get in there. If you feel that wasps or something else have got in there that you don't particularly want, then you might want to get up there or get someone else to go in there and and um, and, and hoik them out. But yes, yeah, so it's what you want to attract. Um, make sure that there's branches that they can land in and that the boxes are easy to get into. But um, yeah, definitely boxes if possible. Do we have any other questions? I think that that is it. So thank you very much. And hopefully our paths will cross and you will get a whole bunch of new little birds going into your garden and staying there. Thank you.